please join me in silent prayers. Dua. Allahumma amin. Thumma amin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. By the grace of Allah Taala, today we are in the company of respected Jahangir Khan Sahib. Mulana Abdul Ghani Jahangir Khan Sahib was born in London and moved to Mauritius at a very young age. In 1986, at the age of 19, he dedicated his life for the service of the Jamaat. He worked as a missionary in Belgium and was Amir of Jamaat France until 1995, when Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih called him to London to work in MTA International. He is currently head of the International French Desk, so he came to Canada for the first time as a representative of Marcus. I will humbly request Inspector <coughs> Mulana Sahib to please address us. And Mulana Sahib, this uh, beginning of this year, we started this uh, street that we are holding, Sobat Salihin session with different Buzurgan. So by the grace of Allah Ta'ala, today uh, we are joined by you, yourself. So Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we want to benefit from this opportunity because you had many blessed opportunities with uh, Khulafa. So please share us, share with us the stories. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Dear brothers, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuhu. I wish to thank uh, your dear Sadr Sahib for having very kindly given me this opportunity to be with you. Um, as he has very rightly pointed out, it's my first visit to not only Canada but to the American continent per se. Because one thing you might know about, about missionaries is that we always need a very valid excuse to go somewhere. <laughs> and my valid excuse this time was a French speaking, uh, well, uh, a Jalsa for French speakers, let's say, francophone. So that was the link, you know. So that was enough to drag me here and then to bring me to other places in Canada as well. Now, when I was told that we were going to have a Suhbat al Salihin, I literally asked Nabil Sab, who is the Saleh we're going to be meeting? <laughs> so then he kind of, uh, you know, brought me back down to earth. And, uh, but in reality, um, the, the, the word is correct, it's Salihin. It's a different Saleh, it's not just one. So we're all meeting as Salihs here. We're, you know, I'm benefiting from your presence and your prayers. I hope, inshallah, we'll, you'll be praying for us also. Um, I'll try to share some uh, of the, you know, anecdotes or memories that I have had with uh, Hazrat Khalifa al Rabir, rahimahullah. I was with him for eight years, so with him meaning working with him. Of course, I knew him for much longer than that. I was of the time of the third Khalifa, uh, rahimahullah. So um, I actually met the third Khalifa only once. Unfortunately, I do not remember anything of that because I was only two weeks old. Um, so he visited, uh, visited London and at that time, so I was lucky to have been born just two weeks before. And so I, w I was able to get some prayers from, from the third Khalifa, Rahimahullah. And that was also the very first time that my father met a Khalifa and my mother. Nobody of us had ever met a Khalifa. So that was the, the beginning of it for me. And I met him in the London mosque. So Somehow I got a link created between me and the London Mosque. It was a place I was going to come back to again and again. Um, and as you had pointed out, I was called in 1995 to start working in MTA International, which was based at that time in, uh, at the London Mosque. And we had to be very, very careful because um, I was also living there. So we, also, we also always had to be very careful about the noise levels. When we were walking in the corridors, you know, we had to try and walk softly. But when you're working, you forget. And uh, I think Hutzul was actually listening to us pass by and listening to the things we were saying when he was sitting in, you know, just across the other side of the wall. He must have been listening because uh, I heard later on that um, his walls were actually not soundproof and so he could hear everything in Mahmoud Hall. So imagine I'd right next to his wall in the corridor, sometimes we used to think, what did we say anything which maybe we wouldn't like us to have heard? <laughs> but um, that was how it was, you know, in those days. I remember when, um, when uh, I arrived to work there, there was a, an elderly lady who gave me a very good piece of advice. 
So she told me, she said, when I started working here in MTA, my mother-in-law gave me that advice. She was even older than her. And she said, you must not go so far away from, from, from holy people that you can't hear what they're saying. But you must not go so close to them either that when they speak, their spittle falls upon you. So she said, find a way in between. And that was a very wise piece of advice. And I had to think about it. But I quickly realized that, you know, there are, there are three kinds of people vis-a-vis -vis the Khalifa of the time. There are very few who like to always be running in front of him and coming close to him and, you know, and always kind of being in his face all the time. And sometimes Hazor would tolerate that, but at a certain point then he would push them away. Because uh, these people were you know, trying to you know, take all the time, all the space, and it's not fair. And there were others who would go so far away from him that they wouldn't even hear what he's saying. So both of those people are you know, not behaving correctly. The ones who behave correctly are the ones who stay kind of in the middle. And I can tell you that there is no greater pleasure from working with Hazur than to be called by him himself. So you're not, you're not trying to get called, you're just standing there. But every so often, everyone would have a chance, Hazur would, would either call them or go like this, you know, and then you just run over. And there's a great feeling because then it means Hazur has seen you and he wants to tell you something, you know. So we had some occasions like this, you know, when, uh, when Hazur called us like this. But of course, if you're in Hazur's face, then he's not going to call you because you're already right in front of him. So we always have to try and uh, be moderate and let us all have the, the you know, be in charge of, the, of when we're supposed to speak to him and when we're not supposed to speak to him. So I, I benefited a lot from that piece of advice. And even sometimes when we were kind of hiding behind people, sometimes he'd still call us, he'd see us and call us. And one, on one occasion, we were actually hiding, I and Feroz Alam Sahib, who was in charge of Bangladesh, he still is. What happened was, um, some Murabi Sahiban made a, a bit of a mistake in Germany. And the mistake was uh, not a very big one, but a Buzur there noticed something and he complained to Huzur. Now what he noticed was that every single Murabi who was sitting on the stage was dressed in a uh, suit, suit and tie, you know. Um, and some of them were, mashallah, quite sehatmand. So the buttons were kind of like this, you know, <laughs> on their bellies. And he was very, very upset, that old gentleman. So he went and he told his ul, he said, how is it that these murabis are in this very, you know, holy function? I mean, this is an informal setting now, but that's a very formal setting. And not a single one of them is in an achkan and uh, shwarkamiz. So his ul became upset then. This was Khalifa Rabi, Allah. And uh, he sent out orders, which we all received then, that nobody come in front of me unless either they're wearing shalwar kameez and atchkan, or at least shalwar kameez. Now the problem is that on that occasion, I and Feroz Alam Saab had gone to do translation. We were not going to sit on the stage, we were never coming in front of anyone, and we only had European clothes. So Feroz Alam Saab said, what are we going to do? That's all we have. So what our kind of um, compromise was we, were, we let our shirts out of our trousers. <laughs> and we were hiding as well. That was the other thing we were doing. So unfortunately, we had to keep accompanying Hazur everywhere because we were in the kafla as well. You know, so the, there was a mosque which was being opened or the first stone was being laid. I don't recall very well. I think it was an opening. We had to go. So Alam Sahib was saying, what are we going to do? Hazur is going to see us now. And, He's going to think we're disobeying him, but we had no clothes. We only came with what we had, you know, and there was no way we were going to... And we couldn't ask people, can you, can you, you, know, can you lend us some surak? I mean, it's not very nice to do. So um, we were just standing in the crowd and we were hiding behind like five or six layers of people. Uh, trying not to be seen and kind of, you know, avoiding to look from behind people to see Hazul even. Somehow Hazul spotted us. He said, Jahangir Saab, Feroz Alam Saab, Acha, Abhi Aywe, Acha, Aage Aaje. We had to go in front of everybody then, and we were like, just kind of like, you know, like standing, like kind of hiding. With, and I think Hazur knew, and he started, he started kind of half laughing, half smiling. And he said, how are you, are you okay? And we said, yes, Hazur. So he said, are you having a nice time? And we said, yes, Hazur. 
And uh, he says, well, it's very nice to see you together and all that, you know, and he's kind of making it longer and longer. And we were just wanting to disappear into the ground. <laughs> But then uh, Hazor said, okay, so are we, we're going to some other place. Are you going as well? And we said, yes, Hazor said, oh, it's a Then he left and was, oh my God, like with Batsge, <laughs> you know? So then Feroz Alam Sahib told us, said, Jang Sahib, we must never make this mistake again. Next time we come, even if we're not going to wear them, but we have to have some shalwar kameez in our suitcases, depending on the occasion, of course. But wherever we go now, we have to have them in our suitcase. So I've also brought some Shalwar Kameez with me for here as well, just in case, you never know. <laughs> that was kind of a, a lesson we, we got, you know. So there was that. Um, so we used to uh, receive messages from Hazur like this about different things. So one thing which we used to do was, as we lived in Islamabad, every single day when we were working, which is six days a week, we used to go in a minivan, a minibus, which we called the van. So all the workers, you know, would go in that uh, minibus and we'd go to London. Um, and on the way back, especially in the winter months, usually we had to say uh, Maghrib prayer or, or maybe Isha prayer. And because I usually was car sick, they used to put me permanently in the front. So I was in the, beside the driver. So I had to be the Imam. We did this for many years. So, you know, I was just leading the prayers every time we were going home. And then one day, somebody came in from the private secretary's office and said, Hazur has just found out that while you're praying on the way back, the driver is also praying with you. So that was our routine. So the imam, myself, was leading and the driver would follow while he's driving. So Hazur said, that's not correct because the driver has to concentrate on the where he's going. He said, it's not like when you're on a camel. The camel has a mind of its own. A camel is not going to walk off a cliff. You don't, have to, you don't have to tell the camel, you know, not to fall off a cliff. It's going to save itself anyway. But a car doesn't have a mind. So you have to control it all the time. So it's not the same thing. So when people bring this hadith out, oh, the Holy Prophet used to pray when sitting on a camel. First of all, he didn't pray his father on a camel. He used to get down and pray that. Only the sunnah or maybe the nawafil or something, you know, that's what it was. But when the driver found out, he said, Yar beda gharak. <laughs> then he said, now we have to go all the way home when we're dying. I'm going to have to do my prayer then when, you know, so, yeah, so he wanted to find out who was it who gave that report to Azul. He said, I don't know how many years we have Later on we found out it was somebody who wasn't in the minibus and he was even more mad. He said, I don't know how but anyway, after that, we changed our system. Then the driver didn't have the right to, you know, to, to, to play with us anymore. So, Hazrat Khalifa Rabe, we had, you know, so many memories with him. For example, I don't know if you remember, some, many of you are quite young here, but um, when Hazur became ill, um, we had to stop the programs for a while. But then Hazur wanted to start again. He, just, he started feeling slightly better. But he sent his son-in-law to ask us a question. He said, when I speak English now, I find it very hard to concentrate. So if we can continue in Urdu, then we will continue with the program. Otherwise, let's just call it a day. So it was becoming hard for us all to concentrate, you know, in another language. You know, it's not the same. So I said, of course, we'll do it in Urdu. Although it was harder for me because English is my mother tongue. Urdu is my fourth language. So it's harder in Urdu. But uh, uh, we said yes. But then Hazur said that uh, we've had enough questions now. So all the sorts of questions have been asked. He said, let's just tell each other jokes instead. So um, now my problem was, because it was, remember, it was a Mulukat program in Urdu, but now I have to translate it into French as well, because it's for French speakers, you know. So our class was on Monday, our program. The, Be the Bengali class uh, program was on Tuesday. The German one was on Wednesday, and on Thursday was the Liqam al Arab. So that was in Arabic. Um, now I had to find I had to find jokes that worked both in Urdu and in French. <laughs> so that wasn't easy because you know a, a joke can be great in Urdu, but it just doesn't work in French. And the opposite was also true. So th at, in those days, believe you me, in the 90s, there was only one website which was being updated every week for jokes in Urdu. 
No, I had to read all the jokes and try and find how they work in French and then pick them out. So after a few weeks, one day, Feroz Alam Saab came to me very angry. He said, why are you stealing our jokes? <laughs> I said, what do you mean I'm stealing your jokes? He said, Huzur came and said, I've heard this joke before. And then we asked, but where, Huzur? We haven't said it before. He said, no, in the French program. <laughs> so I was accused now. I was standing as the accused. So I said, but, I said, uh, but hang on. I said, what day is your program again? He said, Tuesday. I said, mine's on Monday, so you're basically taking mine. <laughs> because I came with them first. And then I said, where are you getting them from? And he told me the same website. <laughs> there was only one in those days, you know? So then we compromised. So I said, okay, let's go through them. And then you, you take, because he was luckier. Most of the jokes in Urdu also worked in Bangla because, you know, they're close languages. We had more trouble. So in the end, you know, he stopped complaining and, you know, we just got on with it and just hoped, inshallah, there's no overlap. <laughs> but the thing is, we used to, each person in the program used to, used to present maybe two jokes maximum because we'd have one round and another round, you know. But Azul, between each one, he'd tell a joke. And he was telling so many jokes. And they were always, almost always new jokes. And there were literally thousands of jokes. And he remembered the Anad. So how does he remember these jokes? <laughs> We've also read many jokes. But if you, if you sit down now and you tell, OK, tell me all the jokes, you know. How many will be able to tell? Maybe 10 maximum, you know. And Azul was just pulling them out like this. So that was an, uh, uh, another thing. On one occasion, we had, um, uh, you know, the, some of the, the children in our class, in our program, used to present um, uh, poems. They used to recite Nazmi or some <laughs> poems or something. And there was this family, a Mauritian family, actually. So they had, uh, they had a few daughters. And the daughters and the mother would sing the Nazms when it was their turn. And uh, the father would sit beside me. So he's on my side here. So one day they started, uh, they were just about to start their nazam and Huzur suddenly turned to the father and said, don't you want to join in? He said, no Huzur, he said, I only sing when I'm having my shower. <laughs> so then Huzur laughed and said, Atatika. So then they, they did the, the nazam. And it so happened that on that day it was also their turn to bring the snacks. So we used to have snacks at the end and Huzur used to have maybe one or two things. His favorite thing used to be jinge. So like prawns, you know, big shrimps. And he didn't eat much else those days. He wasn't well, but he always ate jinge. And even sometimes he'd, he'd ask, Is, have you all had some? Do you mind if I take these up with me? And the lady who'd made them that day, of course, she'd like ready to die now. You know, has always taken my food up to his house. You know, just a pleasure. You can't imagine, you know. So that day they'd brought a lot of things and they put it on the table at the end of the program. And Hazrat said, this is a very lavish feast. He said, who prepared this today? So the, I said, it's the lady with her daughters. You know, she did it. So uh, he sa Hazur said, when did you find the time to make all this? So I said, Hazur, she made it while her husband was having a shower, singing. <laughs> <laughs> so Hazur laughed a lot because he just said that in that program, you know. So when the program was finished, the man told me in a jo jokey way, he said, you did my bezity in front of the whole world, <laughs> you know. I said, but you're the one who told them you sing in the shower. You know, you're looking for trouble. So we, this is how we used to joke with Hazur as well. He was very lighthearted. And sometimes, you know, when Hazur walked in, sometimes the children would run up to him and hold his hand and swing on his hand, swing on his achkan. And he'd let them. And sometimes he'd pick them up, throw them up in the air, catch them, sit them on his knee. The youngest uh, participants we had were the same family again. They had twin daughters. So the last of their children were twin daughters. When they were just, I think, four days old, they brought them to the program. One was called Sadia and one was called Nadia. So they put one Sadia this side, Nadia this side, fast asleep on their little recliners, you know. And Hazur was talking to them, but they were fast asleep. And so they became the youngest uh, children to have ever taken part in an MTA program because they were only four days old, you know. Maybe there's been some after, I don't know, but those were definitely the youngest then. So this is, you know, the kind of uh, the, the times we used to have with, uh, with uh, Khalifa Rabi. Now, with Khalifa Khamis, we've, we didn't have any recorded programs. Khalifa Khamis, Ayatollah, he wanted to do programs with the youth, with the children, you know, and start off like that. And now you've seen, you know, there's been so many programs with uh, Jamaats and with Amlas and all this, as you've seen. 
But um, I remember when Huzur became Khalifa. In the beginning, it was, it was obviously a very, very hard time for us because Hazrat Khalifa Rabi now has just passed away. And now we have a new Khalifa. So what Huzur said, he said, I want to meet all the workers here at Fazl Mosque. So all the MTA workers, all the Vakalat workers, you know, like Vakalat al Tabshir, Vakalat Mal, all the others, and all the desks. So we were the desks. So um, first, Huzur said, bring everybody into Mahmud Hall, and I'll stand on the stage, and they can walk up, and then they can meet me, and then they can walk back down, because there's steps on either side, you know? So every single person went up and met Huzur, and then when I went up, Huzur held my arm, and he said, uh, thank God you could speak Urdu, because otherwise your French programs would have stopped. So Huzur knew about that, you know? Somebody must have told him that Huzur had said, but if it's in Urdu, then fine, if otherwise we'll have to call it a day. So uh, that was the very first thing which Azur told me. So the next day then we had, um, we had mulakats, like working mulakats, but very, very short ones. This time it was department by department going in. Now in my department, there was only me. Now there's two of us, but we used to just be me. So I, they said, okay, French desk, so I just walked in. And then uh, Azur again came and held, held my arm once again. And I think he was doing that because I was so sad, because it was a very, very difficult time for us all. And as I was telling some people today, it was particularly difficult for Feroz Alam Sahib and myself because people from around the world would associate us, us with the Khalifa, because they'd seen us sitting beside him. So for many months, even after Hazur passed away, the people who were coming for the first time, for, for them, this was the time now when they're feeling that Hazur has died. And in the meantime, we're trying to heal. But every time they'd see one of us, they'd, some people would come who were very emotional, and they'd grab us, and they'd cry into our shoulder, and unload all their emotions on us, and they'd rip our wound open again. So we took about six months to get out of that. Everyone else had moved on, but we couldn't move on because of the people. But we couldn't do anything because that was the only thing they could hold. So it wasn't there anymore. So they were holding us instead, you know? So this was one thing which I'd never thought of that it could happen. I have a very good friend of mine who, when Hazrat Khalifa Rabi passed away, uh, now all this is being organized by the Naz Naziri Allah now, who's, ne next, who's the next Khalifa to be. He didn't know he was going to be Khalifa. But he was organizing it, he'd come from Pakistan, he was giving the orders, telling them what they have to do. So he said, I got an order to go to Islamabad I and another Khadim, and to start digging a, a trench. So he said, he said, this day of all days when everybody, the whole world is at Fazl Mosque, you know, for the election of the new Khalifa. And we're here digging a trench in Islamabad. Why? You know, anyway, he said we had to obey, so we went and we did it. He said we put lights out, it was night time, and we were digging and digging, and then uh, when we dug a, a kind of a, a shallow trench, they said, no, 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 deeper. So they said, we kept on digging. Then they said, longer, wider, you know? So they kept on digging. In the end, it turned out that was the tomb, the grave. So they didn't even know why they were digging. But they said, then when they brought the body, nobody told us anything. He said, but when they brought the body, he was being lowered into that grave. He said, then we thought, we're the only two people in the world who got that chance to do this. The whole world was over there, we were the only ones here. So then he said, then I felt blessed, you know. So this was something that, that the Nazir Allah had uh, decided, that we should have this, at least these two khudam, you know, to go and dig that there. But don't tell anyone, because it's a security issue, obviously. You know, if people know this is the grave, then maybe somebody might try and come and do something. So it had to remain secret. So even the diggers didn't know what they were digging. They thought maybe they're going to lower some machine in or something, and they had no idea at all. So um, uh, then uh, there was something which was uh, to do with uh, the actual burial. I wanted to tell you something about that also. Um, on the day of the burial, so now Hazur has become the new Khalifa, and we went for the janaza, we had the janaza. Then they started announcing the different kinds of people who are going to come into the Kitakhas where Hazur is going to be buried. So we heard, we were listening to all the categories, so we heard, uh, so the wukala, you know, the wakils, 
So the Wakils got up and went, and then they said, um, UK missionaries. So the UK missionaries started going. And then they were saying these and those and whatever. And the Alam Sahib said, I didn't hear any category for us. Did you hear anything? I said, no. So we listened and listened and listened, and there was Amla and the this and Amla that and everything. You know, Sadr this, Sadr that, but nothing. So we just stayed seated, and then I, I told Alam Sahib, he was very upset. I said, Alam Sahib, if they haven't called us, then we'll just stay with the ordinary, I mean, ordinary Jamaat. We're not going to be, everybody can't go in, there's not room for everyone. So it doesn't matter. I said, you know, we'll be here, we're at the funeral anyway, you know. So that's fine. So I said, okay. So we started walking around. He said, at least let's go near, you know, where the burial is happening. So we kind of, we gravitated towards where it was all happening. When we got near enough, suddenly, one of the Khandan people rushed out. He said, where were you? I said, we were here. We weren't called. So we've been looking for you everywhere. Come in quick, 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 quickly, come in. You know? So I went in. I was given a bowl of something. I looked at it. There was sand inside the bowl. And I didn't know what to do with that. Why have they given me the sand in, in, in a bowl? So I just walked there. And then he said, go forward, go forward. So I, I went forward. And Hazur was standing there looking at me oh, at the head of the grave. And then I, I kind of realized now, okay, I have to take the earth out, the, the sand out, and throw that in. So I took three handfuls out and put them in. And then I handed the bowl back. And, um, and then the burial took place, and they, they covered it up. And I, I managed to go in. I still don't know to this day how we got in. But we weren't called. But we still got in somehow. Now, why am I telling you this? It's because my mother had come visiting and she was supposed to go back to Ireland. My mother's from Ireland, by the way. So she's, uh, she's historically the second uh, Ahmadi from Ireland. So she was supposed to go back, but then there was the death of the fourth Khalifa. So she stayed. So she told her family, I'm going to come later. So when she went back, she started telling them that, you know, I apologize, but we had, you know, our Huzur. They know about Huzur, at least, you know, in her family. They're all Catholics. Uh, so he passed away, so we had to bury him, and that's why I'm late. They said, yeah, we know. She said, how do you know? She said, we've been watching it for the last four days on Sky, Sky you know, the Sky Satellite Group. So they also got MTA on that. And she thought, maybe they're just saying it like that, you know. Then they said, and we saw your son, and he was holding a bowl of something, and he was throwing it into the grave. What was it? Then she knew they really had watched. The whole time they'd been watching the whole thing, right from Fazal Mosque, and then the cortege going to Islamabad, and, and then the funeral, and they watched the whole thing. And those, there were so many people around the world who must have been watching. And she comes from just a tiny little village in, in Ireland, and people were watching her there. Imagine, you know? So we were quite happy to know that MTA had reached that far, and that people were actually paying attention to all this. Now, there was something which I... I mentioned in, uh, in uh, Ottawa, I'm going to ask uh, forgiveness for the, to Nabil Saab because he's heard this a, a fair few times. But it's, uh, it's a nice thing because it brings the two Khulafa together. In 1989, Hazrat Khalifa Rabi Rahimahullah had planted a walnut tree to mark the centenary of the Jamaat uh, in Islamabad. But he'd also said something quite bizarre when he put it in the ground. He said, this tree will not bear any fruit until the tabliq of the UK bears fruit. Now, what happened was that, tree, you know, walnut trees, I mean, I do gardening. If you plant a walnut tree, often the very next year you start getting walnuts on it. Or maybe two years or maybe three years later. But after so many years, when I came and I saw the tree, there was nothing on it. And the tree was also quite small still. So when I moved there from France, I started uh, weeding around it and putting... Um, uh, compost and watering it and you know looking after it year after year nothing then Hazrat Khalifa Khamis came and many more years went by so it was around uh, 2006 one day we received the visit of the National uh, Secretary Tabli for the UK he's an Algerian he was at that time he's called uh, Kamal Barruja Sahib he, was, he brought some guests with him from Germany, and he, he saw me in Islamabad and said, could you give us a guided tour, please? So I said, of course. So I said, okay, well, we might as well start by this historic tree. So I told him the, the background about it, who put it in the ground and all that, you know. 
Um, and I said, and it's never be born fruit up to now, you know? So that was like more than like 15 years later, it's still nothing. So uh, he started looking among the leaves and he said, well, what's that then? And I saw a walnut for the first time, a tiny little walnut, but it was there. So we kept on looking and we found five, five walnuts. So I said, this is amazing. So I was going to have mulakad very soon, so we're not finished talking about my other things. I said, Azur, there's a little thing about Islamabad I'd like to tell you. Azur said, but I... So I told Azur about what had happened with the tree, how Khalif al-Rabi had put that in the ground, what he said. And then we found now, Kamal Baruja has found five, you know, walnuts on there. So Azur became silent. And then he said, this means we're going to get some converts in Algeria. Okay? So a few days after that, Kamal Baruja Saab told me Huzur had already planned to send me to, to Algeria. You know, I'd been planning it for a few weeks now. I'm just about to leave. Please pray that we, we get some fruit. I'm going to do a tablir tour. I said, okay. A couple of days later, he rang me. He said, Mabruk. I said, what's happened? He said, we got some converts. I said, how many? He said, five. Yeah. So the two things came true. He was the National Secretary Tabli for UK. And Hazur said, as long as the UK doesn't get any fruit, this tree is not going to get any fruit. So it was the UK's Tabli, really. But Hazur Khalifa Khamis said, but we're going to get them in Algeria. So it was a UK, you know, UK went fishing in Algeria, basically. And they caught the fish there. But it was a UK effort. So Hazur Khalifa Rabi's uh, words also came true. And Hazur Khalifa Khamis's words also came true. And since then, every year it's been producing walnuts. So I think uh, things must be going much better for the tablir in the UK. It's definitely more organized now. They have a very good uh, and very active secretary tablir who is uh, Ibrahim Ikhlaf Sahib. I don't know if you know him. He is like 100 men put into one. And he's always moving fast and running and rushing and organizing and this and that. And if there's any kind of obstacle, he said, no, no, inshallah, it'll I'm going to go and see Hazur. He just goes and sees Hazur. And then he comes out and said, mashallah, Hazur said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so he's is, is done. And the work just keeps going on and on. And then we have somebody to look after the new converts as well, because our big problem in the UK and also in the Western world in general is converts come, but then they disappear. You have to look after them. So we have Mr. Jonathan Butterworth who is the secretary, uh, national secretary for new converts. I also happen to double up as the um, secretary for new converts in Farnham. So that's one of my side jobs. And so I also report to him, you know. And mashallah, we only have one new convert in Farnham. So my work isn't all that heavy. And I told him, I said, for the first time in my life, I've realized that one secretary's job depends entirely on another secretary's production. <laughs> so if the tablir secretary doesn't bring anything, I don't have any, any work to do, you know. So this is something which uh, Hazrat Khifa Khamis has now instituted, and it's working really well. And they're getting all the converts to become, you know, very active and, uh, you know, so they don't go away then, they stay. You know, this is, this is the, the main thing. So uh, apart from that, if there are any questions, if there's anything in particular, anything you've seen on MTA or something else, if you'd like to ask something. Walaikum salam. Walaikum salam. Walaikum salam. Telepathic experiences? How many? Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe a few. I thought you said two. No, no, I said few. Oh, few, a few. Yeah. Well, you know, we always used to, well, some of us used to feel that Hazur was telepathic, Hazur Ibn Abe in particular. And why we used to feel that? It's because. Many, many times you'd go in front of him and you have something to tell him and before you open your mouth, he tells you the thing. So how does he know? So also, I had a, you know, an, a, a, an, a, an experience sitting in, a hall, in, a, in an assembly where Hazur is standing and speaking and somebody from very, very, very far away from the Jamaat walked in and I immediately thought, how come this guy is here? You know, like he never comes and today he's here. And the minute I thought that, Huzur went like this and looked at me like that, you know? <laughs> so I said, did he, did Huzur hear what I just thought? <laughs> you know, so I had suspicions. <laughs> so one day we actually asked Hazrat Khalifa in our program. We said, Huzur, are you telepathic? 
He said, actually, I am. Everybody like, went like this on their seat, then, <laughs> you know? And then he said, but don't worry, I can't read all your thoughts. He said, only Allah can read all your thoughts. He said, but I can read a lot of them, though, <laughs> you know? So after that, every time I came to sit, I was speaking to Huzur, but in my mind, I was saying, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. <laughs> that was going on in my mind, yeah? In the background. So no thoughts are going to come out, you know? Stonewall. So, yeah. But we also had the same experience with Hazrat Khifa Khamis. And uh, many people will tell you, no, they're going in for Mulakad, and Huzur does not know why they've come. And while they're at the door, he's already telling them, Acha, aap lagta hai falan baat ke liya rahe hai aaj. You've come for this thing or that thing. And they asked people, did you tell Huzur why I'm coming? And they said, we don't even know why you've come. And Huzur is already known. So he must have felt something, you know. And also people say that sometimes they want to say something in a mulakat, but they don't dare. And then Huzur said, Aapne iske baare mein kyun nahi tha? You know. So then he'll say to himself, why didn't you ask about this particular thing? Which was the thing which they wanted to ask about. So that means that they have some special mental capacities as well, um, you know, and uh, so basically you have to be super careful. <laughs> but, but the lesson isn't that you have to be fearful of Huzur, of course. The, the lesson is you have to remember that if Huzur can read some of your thoughts, now imagine Allah has, can read all of them. And Allah has the power in his hand. Allah can destroy all of us if he wants to, you know. So it's only Allah's grace that we're still alive, that he's not striking us down with lightning or anything like that. So we always have to remember that. So whenever a bad thought comes in your mind, you always have to do istighfar, try and get it out. And uh, ask Allah to not allow these thoughts to come anymore, you know. Um, and so Huzur is just like a reflection of that. He just, he's like a reminder, you know. He makes you remember that this is how things work in the spiritual world. So, yes, is there, apart from that, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yes, please. Wa alaikum I just have a question with regards to you dedicating your life as a journey the age. So, uh, being in the presence of the Khalifa of the time during those days, as well as uh, other very pious figures, like you mentioned, you're living in Islamabad, so like Jesus, for example, and other figures of Islam MTA. So how, what impact did that have, you as such, uh, have on you at such a young age? Well, there's one incident which I, I uh, talked about yesterday in Ottawa. There was an impact on, the, on one machine, at least, that I can t tell you of. You know, Huzur liked to use new gadgets, any kind of new gadget that came out. He was always very interested in using it. So somebody came with a new gadget and he said, Huzur, if you hold this thing in your hand, it can tell you if you're stressed or if you're calm. So if you're stressed, it'll be red, flashing red. And if you're calm, it'll flash green. So Huzur said, okay, get everybody here. <laughs> and I said, everyone try it. So everybody held in their hand, they all flashed red, <laughs> except for Huzur and Chinisa, they were green, yeah. So Huzur said, you're all stressy people, <laughs> you know? You're all full of stress, you should be calm. I said, look at Chinisa, you know? So, there was, but it was kind of uh, to be expected because Chinisa, you know, he was that kind of, t of a man. That was his temperament. I'll tell you something about Chinisa now, if I can go a little bit off topic, because we are talking more about the Khulafa, but I mean, he's like a, a, another reflection of the Khulafa, really, in a way, you know? Because he was such a f close follower. You know, some of, I used to do, um, I used to hold a Khuddam class in Islamabad for the, for the older Atfal and the young Khuddam, so between 12 and 20, kind of. We used to do Arabic and um, we used to do Dini art and that kind of thing. Hmm? So the parents, they were starting to tell me, you know, oh, my son is going to go to university now and we're so worried and we don't know what's going to happen and we've seen other cases, you know, kids have got lost and all that, you know. So we don't know what to do. So they said, please stay in contact with them. So I said, yeah, I'll stay in contact, but I went to see Chini Saab. And I said, Chini Saab, I said, uh, the parents are starting to get a bit worried now because there's a whole batch of young men who are going to be going out now to university. And they fear, you know, that uh, they're going to come to harm, they're going to be lost. Can you please pray for them? He became very serious. He said, I will definitely pray for them. Now, a few days later, he rang me. He said, come to my office, I have to tell you something. So I went. He said, I've been praying for the young people in Islamabad ever since you told me. 
He said, and I've seen a dream, and now I'm not worried anymore. He said, in the dream, every khadim or every itiful was a, was a fruit tree standing somewhere in Islamabad. And he said, I saw each one of them was flowering and bearing fruit in a different season. Each one in its own season, you know. So he said, it means some of them will be early bloomers and some of them will be late bloomers, but they'll all be okay. So tell the parents they don't have to worry, they'll be fine. You know, so I went and told the parents, and they were, they were actually quite relieved, you know, that Chini Sahib had actually prayed and seen a dream and all that. So that was one thing, you know, about, uh, about Chini Sahib. There was the one time when Hazrat Khamis came in and he asked Chini Sahib to hand him over his stick, his walking stick, and he wanted to try it out, you know, and he said it's a solid stick, and, you know, <laughs> then he gave it back to Chini Sahib. Chini Sahib was so happy because he was always held it. Um, and he, he always used to walk to the mosque very, very slowly when he was getting very old. And I spoke to his son Dawood, who's a doctor, and I said, couldn't we get him like a little, you know, mobility vehicle, you know, for, for him to go from the house to the mosque and back, because it's a long walk for him. And he could fall also, you know. He said, I've already told him that so many times he, he doesn't want. So I went and I said, let me try. So I said, Chini Sahib, I said, uh, you know, we're all worried looking at you walking like this, you know, and we know you're making a big effort and all that, but if you fall, then that won't be good. So maybe Dawood could get you a mobility vehicle and you could sit. And he told me, ha. Huh? He said, he did, he did tell me about that. He said, but the thing is, the manifestations of Allah that I'm seeing in this state that I am now, I didn't see them before. So I want them to continue. So I'm going to keep walking as long as I can walk. And so it was very, very difficult for us also because I could never, ever just walk past him and go. It was disrespectful. So I had to walk with him. That meant walking five centimeters an hour. But I do it because he's a bazooka and you know, you don't walk ahead of bazooka. He used to say, just go, you know, leave me, it's fine. I'll say, no, it's fine, I'll walk with you. And sometimes he used to do his prayer and fall asleep in the prayer, and then his wife would ring me, can you please go to the mosque and see if he's there? So I'd go in and I'd find him asleep on a chair, and one time I thought he'd died. I literally thought he was dead. He wasn't moving at all. So I went and I said, Chini Sahib, he didn't answer. I said, Chini Sahib, loud, he didn't answer. Then I touched him and then he moved. I said, okay, alhamdulillah, <laughs> we still have him, you know? But that was his dedication uh, to the mosque. He never, ever missed... The, the prayers. And that was also because of his close affiliation to the Khulafa. And he used to be very, very, he had a lot of gharat, like very jealous for the honor of the Khalifa. He couldn't uh, admit to any kind of uh, dis disrespect to the Khulafa of any type, and especially disobedience. He didn't like that at all. The only time he'd get upset with children, he was always very kind to children. But when the children would be disobedient, he would get really upset. And he tell them, you have to be obedient, because obedience is everything. All the blessing comes from obedience, you know? And it starts at home. So if you're not obedient at home, you will not be obedient to the Khalifa either, you know? So that was uh, kind of one thing which he used to remind us of. And both Khalifa had a great love for him. They used to esteem him a lot. Um, and they would invite him to every program. And he would be old and not well and all that, but he'd still go. And sometimes he'd fall asleep in the program, but he'd be there, you know. So that was his uh, kind of his sacrifice that he was the sacrifice he was making when he was, you know, in his final years. Any other thing? Can you mention the incident where uh, in Rabwa when someone was insulting the Promised Messiah? Oh, yes, it wasn't in Rabwa. It was when Chini Sahib was posted in one of the other jamaats, and there was a non Ahmadi who started insulting the Promised Messiah, and Chini Sahib got very upset. And he said, may Allah close your mouth. And that man went, and then somebody ran back and told Shini Sahib, he said, that man has just fallen, and he's fallen on his chin, and he's bitten his, half his tongue off. The tongue just was bitten off and fell out. And Shini Sahib started to cry, and he said, I shouldn't have said that. He said, I've said that, now it's happened, you know. But Allah as well had so much ghairat for him, you know, that he made that thing happen. So we used to benefit from Chini Sahib's prayers. Whenever there was anything at all, you know, we'd just go and tell Chini Sahib, please pray for us. So I, I, I didn't really answer your question though, did I? Yeah, so we of course we benefited 
this is kind of a way that we benefited from, from him and from Huzur, was obviously the prayers. You know, even if you're just, this is one thing about being near Huzur, even if you don't talk to him and you don't meet him, but you just sit there, you get something, and when he sees you, it's like a dua. You know, like when he sees you and you're there, then obviously something is coming out of his heart. So, it, I mean, you know, everyone gets their own share, but even if you're not there, and you have the intention of being there, I'm quite sure Allah will, will reward people according to their intention as well. Because, you know, like, for example, ladies who can't go out to work like the men do for the Jamaat, even by just staying in their homes and looking after their homes, they'll get an equal reward. If they can't go for namaz, it doesn't mean they're not getting a reward. They have it the easy way. They can get the reward while not doing their namaz. We have to go and actually do the namaz to get the reward, you know? So... It doesn't mean that they're being deprived in any way. On the contrary, it's just made easier for them. Yes. Any other question? Yes, please. Wa Wa alaikum salam. Something about the 100 mosque project for Jalsa project. Oh, you remembered. Yes, so <laughs> one year in Germany, Hazrat Khalifa Rabi announced that um, Germany has to build 100 mosques before its centenary. Um, I'm pretty sure it was, a, it was linked to their centenary. I might need to be corrected on that. But anyway, Hazur said he wants them to make 100 mosques. So it so happens that uh, Hazur had given us, when we used to go on tours of him, he used to give us some money to go and spend. But I'd got 100 Deutschmark. So as soon as Hazur had finished, I rushed to the office and I wanted to find that Sakti Mal. So he wasn't there, but Amir Sahib came in. I said, Amir Sahib, I need to make a contribution. So he called the Sakti Mali, came in, he said, bring your receipt book. And he took it and, and he said, how much? I said, 100 Deutschmark. And I said, but there is a condition. I said, I want you to put one Deutschmark in every single mosque you're going to make out of those 100. <laughs> and Amir Sahib said, oh my God. <laughs> he said, I wanted to be the first one to do that. <laughs> he said, anyway, he said, we have to admit, you know, you were faster. So then he also did the same, but with a bit more money, obviously, because we're not beyond, so. <laughs> but uh, I got that, alhamdulillah, I had that chance, you know, to, to put, so in every mosque you see in Germany, one Deutschmark of that has gone in there for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only because I happened to be with Hazur, I had the chance, you know, that I was there. Yeah. That's uh, all right. Mention the, the letter from Africa. Oh, I can't say that again. <laughs> no, that's too, too moving. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Sorry, yeah? You really want me to say it? I think yeah. It's very hard for me to say it, though. That's the thing. Maybe you can tell them or... Yeah. You Maybe like to... The end? Huh? Maybe the last thing you would say. Atta, before I run out crying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any other thing? Yes? Um, I have a question uh, about homeopathy, actually. Uh, there has been some, you know, I've been in, I interacted with some youth lately. Uh, 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 and you know, uh, there's an a, there's a section or segment who don't really believe in the empirical evidence or you know the other yeah. stuff about homeopathy. And then you know, there's part of belief as well. So just keeping the question concise, what is you know because you've experienced Azur's classes and everything. So well, I can tell you one thing about homeopathy. It's that when it's when it comes to human beings then belief in it has a, plays a, a big role. Now, some people will say that's auto-suggestion then. That is your, it's actually your own mind that's curing you. But that's not entirely true. But if you don't believe in it, it's not going to work on you. You need to also believe that this thing is going to help you. But when it comes to animals, they don't know what you're giving them. And yet it works. Now, they can say that's anecdotal, which it can be, but when you have a lot of anecdotes following one after the other, then it kind of ceases to be anecdotal. Then it starts to become empirical because it's happening again and again. I've used homeopathy on chickens. I've used homeopath homeopathy on quails. I've used it on cats. And it's always worked. And it works very fast, you know, and they don't know what you're giving them. So how is it working? Like, for example, you have the case of, uh, in both chickens and in quails, of, uh, it's uh, called the, the ovipositor prolapse. So they have a, a part of the, you know, in, in insides, 
which deposit the egg. But sometimes when they keep on laying, then it starts coming outside of the body. And it's, it's very difficult to push back in again because it, it has to be pulled in from the inside, you know. But if you give them pulsatilla, so I was giving them pulsatilla 30, three times a day. Within a day, it would go back in by itself, which is not what usually happens. Usually, it'll keep on hanging, then they might get infections and then they'll die. So I've seen them. I had one case where I had uh, one of my cats uh, had got uh, a, a, an abscess on its, on its face and the skin on the face was, is very tough. So I tried to lance it, you know, which is very hard to do on a cat. We had to wrap the cat up in a, in a towel, have another person hold it really tight because cats will scratch and bite, you know, they don't like to be held like that. Uh, and you I tried to lance it and the needle wouldn't go in. The skin was so tough. So I said, okay, I'm going to give it uh, Cilicia 30. Cilicia brings anything foreign from the body out. So uh, before I left for work in the morning, I gave one dose. I came back in the evening, I gave another dose. I was supposed to give three, but I only gave two. I gave another dose again the next morning, and when I came back in the evening, it had opened all by itself, everything had come out, and the place was flat again. The cat had cleaned it all by herself, you know? So, these are the things which you see. I mean, that's just a few examples. I've used so many other times. And on ourselves as well, we've seen, you know, how, uh, how it works. But as I said, you have to believe in it. So, there are even some doctors who, are, who don't agree with it. But they don't believe in it. So, they don't see the, the effects. But then there are other doctors who do believe in it, and they see the effects. You know? So, yes. So, I mean, you have to tell them, you know, that... There are a whole load of things out there which uh, we don't know yet. And we have to be humble. We mustn't be uh, arrogant and think we know it all. There are other forms of medicine. There are, you know, traditional, there's traditional medicine as well. And there's truth in a lot of them. So we have to study and we have to try and find it. Huzur spoke about one uh, last year, I think it was, about a lady who had uh, cancer of the uterus. And she'd been written off by her doctors. She's not going to survive. And then she saw in a dream there was this little shrub. Um, and in the dream, it's a very common shrub in Punjab. It spoke to her and said, I am your cure. So she went, took the leaves, and I think maybe boiled them or something and started using it, and she was completely cured. And now we have doctors in the UK actually working on it and trying to develop a medication out of it. And, and they have very promising results so far in the cases they've used it on. So there's all that, you know, so we mustn't think, you know, that that's it now, you know, modern, modern medicine is the be-all and end-all of everything. It's not. So, Mulasa, I think we want Time to is use, running out, no, is we it? We want to use this time for the... Uh, hmm? uh, yeah, African <laughs> letter story and <laughs> also like... Achha, Zang Mulasa. You have made more than that. I was cold. Achha, that was good. It was good. So, if you can share like more about it. Achha, the Khulafa. Well, the thing is, you have to ask me questions because then I, I, might, I might remember, you know. It's very hard to just pull them out of nowhere as well. Normally, we used to ask questions, but sometimes we feel maybe we can distract you. So, that's why... Achha, uh -huh. like I remember one. Uh, where Hazrat Khalifa Rabeh called me one day and he said, um, I was very young then, I was only 20 at the time. And Hazrat said, we have a new convert coming from Spain. And he's the same age as you. Um, and I want you to stay with him and talk to him about Islam, you know, teach him namaz and all these things. You know, he's coming to stay here for a little while. So can you do that? And I said, yes, I'd love to. And I said, uh, he speaks English, doesn't he? And he said, no, he doesn't. So I said, does he speak French? He said, I don't think so. I said, well, what does he speak then? He said, well, obviously he speaks Spanish. <laughs> and I said, but I don't speak Spanish as well. He said, yeah, I know, but you'll do something or other. <laughs> he was coming in two weeks' time. And I have never spoken a word of Spanish except for maybe gracias in my life. So anyway, I rushed to the shops. I bought myself a Teach Yourself Spanish book. And luckily, Spanish isn't too far away from French. You have an idea. You know, it's a Latin language as well. So... Every day, morning and evening, I was studying, studying, studying. So by the time he came, I had kind of broken Spanish. And when I couldn't find a word, I'd take a French one and pronounce it the Spanish way, and it would work <laughs> somehow. 
He'd learned a little bit of French at school, but he didn't know a lot of French, but it was helping. So I was with him. We stayed together for two weeks, and we talked about all kinds of things. He said he wanted to give a gift to Hazur, and he said, I want to translate a poem of the Prophet Sallallahu into Spanish, and I want to give him that. So uh, we chose one very small poem, and we managed to translate it into Spanish. You know? That was without Google or anything now. Yeah? We didn't have all that back then. So then he told me, I, I need to do a mulaqat. So I said, yeah, very good. He said, and you have to come and translate. And I said, I am so not going to do that. <laughs> because I don't know what Azul is going to say, and I don't know what you're going to say, and I'm going to get stuck, and it's going to be like, it's going to be a catastrophe, you know? So he said, but who else then? So I said, I mean, I'm going to go to Tabshir. I'll ask them. So I went in and I said uh, to the Tabshir workers, I said, um, I said, is there anybody who speaks Spanish here in the UK? They looked at each other and said, not that we know of. And I said, even Portuguese, because you know they can, they can understand each other. Portuguese said, nay, baba, koi nahi hai. Aap hi jayin. So I said, dekhi, mujhe to puri aati nahi hai, koi nahi, ab Allah ka naam leke jayin. So I went if Allah ka naam, with the name of Allah. Now, when I was going in, I was saying, oh Allah, please, do not let any word come out of the mouth of your Khalifa that I can't translate. And the same for the young man as well, you know. And in those days, mulakats weren't like two minutes. They were like 45 minutes long, half an hour, one hour. You never know. So we had a 40-minute mulakat that day. And the whole time, Hazor was telling him he wanted to know what he'd studied. And, you know, and he said, I want to send you to South America. And I want you to get ready for that and this and that. And so many big plans and everything. And we were, I was just translating from one to the other. So in the end, Hazor suddenly said, hang on. He said, what are you speaking to him right now then? I said, Hazur, Spanish. He said, but you said you don't speak Spanish. I said, I do now. Hazur said, see, I knew you'd do something. <laughs> but that was hard though. That was, a, that was one of my biggest challenges ever. Now actually he's, he's settled in the, in the UK. He speaks perfect English now. But even now when he sees me, he comes up to me and he'll start saying three words in English and the rest in Spanish. <laughs> you know? by, of course, by now I, I don't remember all the Spanish, but anyway. He helps me to remember. Yeah. Or koi? Sawal hai koi? Story stuck into their mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It's very hard for me, but I'm going to try and control myself. You see, one of the great things about um, receiving letters which are addressed to Huzur is that you get to uh, see what the people talk about. So I can't share the private matters that they speak about. But I can give you kind of uh, the environment in which they've written them and kind of an idea without be becoming personal. And the great thing is that when they write to Hazur about any kind of problem, so Hazur will write back and tell them, I prayed for you, may Allah solve this problem and all that, you know. And then the next letter would come and they say, like, miraculously, this thing was solved. So people would write about all kinds of things. And uh, very often we'll also get uh, that. Um, I've been threatened to be, to be sacked from my job and there's no way out and all that, but please pray because I'm in so much trouble and this and that. And then the next letter would come and say that they changed their mind. Or someone would say, there's somebody harassing me at work and it's a senior officer, so I don't know what to do. And then the next letter would come, he's been transferred. You know, and there was no, they said there was no plan to transfer him, but they, somehow, somehow he was transferred. And that kind of thing. So that keeps your faith going. When you keep seeing how Huzur's prayers are being answered. So anyway, there was this one occasion where I received a tiny little piece of paper like this. It was about this size. And there was writing on it. And it was very thick writing. You know, like when you write and you write over it again? So it becomes thicker. Um, and it was on, written on both sides. And I had to read the whole letter to see who it was from. So... It turns out that at the end, you know, they were asking for prayers for different things, and it was two people who had written the letter. It was a brother and a sister. And anyway, they wrote that Hussur, after a very long time, we've found a piece of paper to write to you. Because you know, in Africa, they're not, you don't have all the facilities that we have here. They said, but it's a very small piece of paper, and we had so many things that each one of us wanted to tell you, but there's not room you know, if one starts writing all the things, then the other one won't have enough room for their things. So we decided, let's choose the things which are common to both of us, and we'll just write those. 
So the brother wrote first, and the sister wrote over. So they wrote the same letter, and that's why the letters were thicker. So I told us all this. I said, this letter is a bit special because of this. So he told me, you write them a very, very loving letter from me, and tell them that, um, that I love them very much, and I appreciate that they did this. So the lesson for us is we have everything. We don't like paper, we don't like pens, we don't like uh, computers, we have everything. And yet people don't write, you know. So what answer will we have in front of Allah on the Day of Judgment? When these people will shine forward, shine forth, and we'll be held back. Allah will say, did I not give you this? Did I not give you that? So what's your excuse? And also, another lesson for us is not to waste paper. Hazrat Muslim Aud used to very carefully cut out if there was something which, is, he, you know, which didn't, wasn't written properly, he'd cut it out very, very carefully and use the rest of the paper. And this was transferred to many older missionaries. You might see them still doing this. The older missionaries saw the hard days. So they don't like to, to throw paper away. Whereas our culture is, you write something, oh, it's no good, scrunch it up, throw it away, start again. And all that paper is wasted, you know? So we have to also learn from that, that we shouldn't waste, because everything that Allah gives us is a, is a, is a favor, is a ni'mat. So we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't play around with Allah's favors either. So those are some of the harder lessons that we learned while dealing with Hazur's letters. But in general, they were always you know, very uplifting. I was telling them one uh, story, I think, I don't know if it was in Montreal I said this, or if it was in Ottawa. But uh, I have a Moroccan friend in, who became Ahmadi while I was in France in Stra Strasbourg, so Strasbourg, which is on the, the border with Germany. When he was 20, he became Ahmadi. And more than 20 years later after I'd left, one day he rang me out of the blue. So this is quite recently. So I said, it's such, so nice to hear from you. We haven't been in contact for so long. He'd found my number from someone. And he got in contact. So I asked him, I said, has anyone else in your family joined the Jamaat since? He said, unfortunately not. I said, in so many years, you know, no one has joined you. He said, I do preach to them. I give them books and all that, but they're not interested. He said, also, my eldest brother is a Salafi. And he doesn't want to even hear the name Ahmadiyya. He's allergic to the name. He said, do not mention that name in front of me. So when he's there, I can't say anything. So I said, did you ever write to Hazur about this? Did you write to us for prayers, you know? He said, no. I said, well, write then. So he wrote. At, this was at the end of November, beginning of December, he wrote. At the beginning of J January, he received his, his reply. Hazur said, I pray Allah may grant you some more people from your family to, for the Jamaat. So two weeks after that, he rang me very excitedly and said, you will not believe what has happened. He said, my mother and my younger brother have become Ahmadi. He said, I preached to them for 20 years with no result. And Hazur prayed for them, and within two weeks now, they've become Ahmadi. And now my big brother said, now my mother and two of my brothers are Ahmadi. He said, give me some books. I need to see what this is about. So now he's reading as well. So then he became very, very active. You know, he had kind of pulled away a little bit, but then he came straight back in again. And now he's the president of the Jamaat of Luxembourg. Yes, it's attached to Germany, but they have their own Jamaat in Luxembourg. So uh, that's, the, that's the power of Hazur's prayers. Things that you can't do in 20 years, he does it in two weeks. You know? So yeah. Is it Jini here? Yes. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Is my hair Jini? Yes. Let's have a little bit. 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 Is there any other question? Anything else? Time is what happened? The time is what happened? The time is what happened? It's 15 minutes. One more if you want to share and then we can have a joke. Yes, but you have a little idea then. کسی خاص بات کے بارے میں شاید مجھے پھر یاد آئے کیونکہ اس وقت تو ویسے بھی تھوڑا سا تھکا ہوا ہوں کیونکہ ہم نے سفر بھی کیا ہے خدام کے حوالے سے کوئی ان کی محبت کا اور کسی حوالے سے ہاں اچھا 
One time we were having, we were holding a Khuddam al Ahmadiyya Ijtima in Islamabad. And Huzur was there. And we were receiving phone calls from Khuddam driving in, coming from London and other places, driving towards Islamabad, saying that we're going to be held up, we're going to be late. And everyone was talking about how come these people are late? They're all saying there was very, very heavy rain falling. And we can't drive fast, you know, we're driving extremely slowly. And there's, now the traffic is starting to jam. Uh, so we're going to be late, you know, we're going to miss out on certain things. And we couldn't understand, because in Islamabad the weather was completely fine. Yet from all around they were, they were ringing saying that they're getting held up because of the rain. And we started noticing that there were clouds all around Islamabad, but not on Islamabad. So the rain was falling everywhere except in Islamabad. And when they arrived, they said it was raining literally until right outside Islamabad. But when we came into Islamabad, there was nothing. And they were saying that Huzur said, Acha, it was Khalifa Rabi, he said that Allah heard, heard our prayers, mashallah, it's like a, it's a big sign, look how Allah stopped the rain. He said, it doesn't mean it's going to always happen like this though. You know, so don't get your hopes up that every single time Allah is going to do this for us. But he showed us like a, a, an example, you know, of his power that he could withhold the rain around where we were. And we were completely fine, completely dry. We were having our barbecues outside and they were dying in the rain, you know, <laughs> all around. So uh, they themselves became witness as well to what was happening and how when they came in, the rain suddenly stopped. And it was quite amazing. So there was also, that was one more in relation to Khuddam, and that was when they prayed for them and then this happened, you know? Yeah. ایک <laughs> 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 In English. English. Yeah. So the question was that Hazor was sitting with different, you know, nationalities and the, each nationality has its own, you know, beha its own behavior, its own uh, ways of uh, being. So did Hazor ever say something about that? Well, first of all, I have to tell you that um, we were the more international program because we were based on French language. So it wasn't a nationality. We had some French people, we had some Algerian people, we had some African people, we had some um, uh, Mauritians as well, from different countries, you know? It was all mixed, but we were linked by French. So it would be difficult to say that we had a kind of a common behavior. But one thing which Azur said, which made all of us very pleased, actually two things. One thing he said was, he said, I really enjoy this program because your style of questions are different, is different. So he said, that's, that's what makes it enjoyable to me. It's not the regular style, it's a different style. And another time Hazur said, you know, he said, after all, he said, we're not here for the questions and all that. He said, that's just an excuse so that we can sit and meet each other. He said, that's why I'm here. I want to see you all. You know, the questions are just a secondary thing. The real thing is I want to sit with you and I want to be with you. And we felt really, we felt really, you know, special and loved. You know that Hazur, uh, Hazur actually said that. So I'll just I'll end with one thing. You know when the, pro when the program is to end, then Hazur is to go downstairs for namaz, and then we used to rush behind Hazur and put our shoes on quickly and follow. So one day when we were rushing down, you know, putting our shoes on quickly to go down, one of the ladies told me, she said, can I ask this question ne in the next program, please? And I said, yes, tell me quickly, you know, because we have to go. She said, some people say when a, when a dog howls, it means somebody has just died. So is that true? So another person, actually the one who used to sing in the shower, he said, that is so not true. I said, how do you know? He said, because our dog used to howl so much, we should all have been dead by now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not true. But we did ask, ask Hazur, and Hazur said he doesn't really believe it's the case, you know, just, just so that you know what he answered. So anyway, Jazakumullah Sunnah Jazal, thank you so much for having given me this uh, opportunity. May Allah bless you in Khudam al as well, in all your activities, and 
especially in uh, your tabligh activities, which you need to increase because the situation in the world now is very dire. At any time, anything can happen. So these might be our last chance to do something to bring the people in. So most of your energy should be geared towards tabligh now. And at the same time, tarbiyat, but as all the khulafa have always said, if you do tabligh, then everything else gets sorted out. Because whoever is, is active in tabligh has to change himself. Because now he knows people are watching him. The eyes from the outside are now on him, so he has to sort himself out. So if tabligh is weak, everything will be weak. And if tabligh is strong, everything will be strong. So this is it now. So you should all pray that Allah enable you to bring the people who really are interested, there are many, to come in. And then that will be your effort, you know, before it's the end for these people. The end is coming. So who will be saved and who will die, nobody knows. But uh, that's why we have to try and make the best effort to bring as many as we can in. Because uh, as Hazrat Masood said, if they're on this ark, then they'll be saved. So we have to try and save them, you know. They just don't know that they need saving. We need to tell them. So may Allah enable you to do that and uh, fulfill Huzur's uh, wishes to the, in the best way, inshallah. Amen. 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 Amen.